All right, let's get started. We are here for RV parks versus boondocking. We are going to cover tips, benefits, and realities. But before we get started, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. And that means there are other words you're going to hear for RV parks. The two most common are going to be resorts and campgrounds. There are some slightly different meanings to them, but in a polite conversation, that's going to get you by, and so that's what I'm going to stick to today. Again, you'll hear lots of people use the other terms, but RV park will get you by in most conversations. Same thing with boondocking. You're going to hear a lot of people mention dry camping. The government actually uses the term dispersed camping on their websites. And wild camping is another one, not quite as common. We're going to just use boondocking. Again, some of these terms have slightly different meanings, but it's all basically boondocking, and that word will get you by most of the time. All right, let's go to the first picture. I can't see it, but I'm guessing it's a picture of an RV park. So when you see this, this is not the way all RV parks look. So when we dive into RV parks versus boondocking, the first thing we have to acknowledge is it's not such an easy comparison. RV parks are not just one monolithic thing. They're all different. A lot of them are different in any case. So if you were to think of the word neighborhood, if this were a cartoon and I could see all your little thought bubbles, everybody would have something slightly different. And that's what RV parks should come to mind the same way. So let's cover RV parks versus RV parks first before we head right over into versus Kunda. Some of the big differences in what you're going to find from park to park are going to be in the amenities. Not that they offer amenities. Most RV parks offer amenities. Some don't. We've seen them. Most of them offer different amenities. And if you don't mind a short list, we're looking at cable TV, laundry rooms, shower house, bathrooms, community rooms are some of the basics. And then you're going to find some with workout rooms, uh, exercise equipment, playgrounds, dog runs. We've seen Zumba classes. You might see um, dances. We had one in Florida that had a dance once a month during the summer and spring. So any combination there is what you're going to find. And that's one of the big differences. Also, price and layout. All right. Let me give you two examples. In New Orleans, there are many different kinds of parks. Uh, there are some RV parks out there that resemble a parking lot. There's just a rectangular gravel lot, some are partial, some are full hookups, and you're going to pay 50 or 60 bucks a night for that. You're paying for the location. You're going to be wedged in there between your neighbors. It doesn't mean it's a bad park, it's just really tight. Or you could go. Let me back up. You also have $120 a night really luxury resorts in or RV parks in the New Orleans area. So when you go to Goshen Springs, Mississippi, most of you have never heard of that. It's on the Ross Barnett Reservoir. All right, Tony's heard of it. Goshen Springs RV park is 34 to $38 a night. You might think, well, good grief. If 50 bucks is a parking lot, what do you get? You get a double wide concrete pad, and then you get grass in between those pads. It's on the reservoir. And they have a laundry room, they have a swimming pool, they have a full office staff, a boat launch. It's really, really nice. So just because something is like that in one place doesn't mean the RV park down the road is going to be the same thing. Some of the other big differences we're looking at are rules, restrictions. Now you could get, whether we like it or not, restrictions on the age of your rig, restrictions on the age of the person. I'm not 55 yet, I don't qualify for some of the Arizona parks. Uh, we're looking at restrictions on pets. Uh, some of them have dog breed restrictions. Some of them allow no pets, no kids. Some of them don't care what you do or when you do it. We're looking at proximity to attractions. That's another big thing. You're going to find RV parks near everything that you want to do, probably, but that's a big difference in what attractions have RV parks near them. You're looking at crime. Crime is going to vary just like anything else from area to area, town to town. Some RV parks will be safer, some will be less so. Cell phone reception and open sky. The reason I say open sky is because if you have satellite, if you have this newfangled Starlink thing, or maybe you have Dish Network, you might want open sky. Not all RV parks have that. We were just down in Yuma, and the trees were so full and so lush that they were touching the RVs beneath them because they'd been there for so long. So that might not be conducive to Starlink, but that may be really what you're looking for. All right, before we dive into boondocking, again, RV parks are not just KOA. They're not just Thousand Trails. You've also got city, state, county governments, even the federal government has RV parks. National parks, Army Corps of Engineers, and again, 
Army Corps of Engineers does not mean you have to have been in the military. You just have to pay the fee. And there's some people, um, a lot of people think they're their favorite parts. The Army, the National, um, the military do have RV parts as well. If you have access, you're retired or you're active duty, they do have a whole plethora of RV parts on their bases. So if that's something you have access to, you might want to check those out. They're very popular amongst traveling RVers. All right, let's go on to the next picture. It should be a boondocking picture, all right? Yes. Okay, good. I can't see the TV. Again, just like with neighborhoods, boondocking spots, even more so, very greatly. I mean, wildly different from one to the next. So the easiest thing to say about boondocking spots is there's only one similarity, and that is that it's somewhere to park. It's literally the only thing that's absolutely common amongst all boondocking spots. Somewhere to park, no hookups. Um, some of the differences, again, are going to be price. And that might seem counterintuitive, but look at where we are. If you're not staying in the BLM land around town, there's the LTVA. It's 180 bucks for seven months. You can stay any length of time within that, but that's 180 bucks. Or you can stay two weeks. There are some other boondocking spots around the country that charge. Most of them do not, but that's, again, a difference from, part, from spot to spot. A lot of length of stay. We already covered that. Seven months here, or you could stay in some places we've seen three days. Um, there are some that have five day stays. It's just different from spot to spot. RV accessibility too. That's another big thing. Man, we've seen a lot of people that just go rip roaring in these places and they don't fit and then they get damaged. If you have any size rig, I don't care if you have a 45 foot apartment complex on wheels towed <laughs> by a tractor trailer or a tractor, you have boondocking spots that'll fit you. Absolutely, there are plenty. But you're gonna have more choices if you're on the opposite end. Say you have a teardrop towed by a Jeep. There are some RV, there are some boondocking spots that'll fit you and won't fit the big boys. And then there's this, I think this is a field, Grouse Mountain. Yeah, this is Grouse Mountain and Bighorn Mountains. This is so big, y'all, you could fit tractor trailer after tractor trailer in this place and have a convention and still not fill it up. It's absolutely huge. And there's plenty of spots like that, but that's one of the big differences. You're also looking at uh, the towns nearby, wildlife, amenities in the area, things to do, cell phone reception, the same open sky. A lot of those vary a lot. All right, some of the entities that provide boondocking. Boondocking, yeah, it's public land. We the people own it, but there's always gonna be a government agency attached to it. And that's helpful to know because when you go looking for boondocking spots, you've gotta know who to look with. So the big two are the National Forestry Service and BLM. But you've also got the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the federal agency. And then you've got the state versions. In Soda Lake, Wyoming, near Pinedale, Wyoming, I forget the exact name of the department, but it's like the fish and game for Wyoming. They run that, and it's a lake, it's a beautiful lake, and they have draft horses, bald eagles, antelope. It's just really epic. Mountains in the background. It's a perfect place for boondocking. If you don't mind a few bugs, we encountered that. But um, it's a great place and it's a state agency. There are some state forests. It's less common with the state forest to offer boondocking, but it does happen. And we're looking at other state local agencies. All right, next picture. This should, you should be looking at a picture of a book of um, an RV park right now. We were here, it's in Florida. It's in Bushnell, Florida. And the big thing that should come to your mind when you see this is there's a lot of people there, right? And just for example, all these pads are double wide pads. It might not look like it, but they are. And grass in between. But there's a lot of folks there. And the biggest thing that you get for a benefit on RV parks, at least in my mind, is sense of community. When you get these many people together, if you want to meet and greet people, if you want a community, if you want to have get-togethers and have dances and classes and all sorts of things, just like if you were living at home in the sticks and bricks, this might be your thing. It's a little bit easier over boondocking to meet folks in a situation like that. For another benefit for, I told you I have notes. Another benefit is they're easy to find. RV parks are very easy to find. All you have to do is type in San Antonio, whatever your favorite city is, New Orleans, Louisiana, type in nearby RV parks, you're gonna get a whole list. Boondocking spots, unfortunately, are not quite that simple, at least not with the main search engines. 
We're also looking at RV parks often are found near attractions, national parks, state parks, uh, man-made stuff, big aquariums, whatever you want to go to, wherever you're going to a specific place, there's probably a handful of RV parks. I can't always say they're going to be the best, but you're almost always going to find an RV park within 30 minutes to an hour of a major destination. Another benefit is you can make reservations for many RV parks. Not every one, but many, more so than boondocking. So if you're the kind who wants to plan six months in advance, we have friends who plan their whole year out. It doesn't mean you can't boondock, but some people do plan that into their schedule, but it is easier to make reservations and plan ahead if you are doing RV parks. And RV parks usually have either full hookups or partial hookups, so that's another benefit. Obviously, you know, the bushes outside and the LTVA do not provide anything useful for you. Uh, let's see, let's go on to the boondocking benefits. Okay. All right, I remember the picture. This is, again, in Wyoming. And the first thing that ought to come to your mind, the first thing that comes to my mind when I see this, is it's a completely unique experience. Now, that's not a promise to say every boondocking spot is like this. Some of them may resemble somebody's backyard. It may just be a patch of grass behind a tree. But you're more likely to find this when you're boondocking. To be perfectly fair, there are lots of RV parks out there with glamorous, epic views. But what are you going to pay for that? This was absolutely free. It was White Mountain. There are some wild horses in the area. Um, absolutely amazing. One of the other benefits that come to my mind, just based on this spot alone, is more potential for Epic, cheaper. This was free, no permits, no nothing. It was absolutely free, penniless to go there. Possibility of better views, more seclusion. Let me tell you about seclusion. If you're a people person and you want to be around folks, you can do that boondocking, but here, I got out Google Satellite and I measured. Our nearest neighbor was one and a half miles away. No kidding. And next to him, I don't know if it's him or her, I couldn't tell at that distance, but next to them, they were probably a good mile or so from there. And there were no RV parks within several miles of this location. There were some in the zip code, but none of them had views anything close to this. And this was about eight, seven thousand, eight thousand feet elevation, so in the summertime, you can control your weather. It's a little bit nicer, a little cooler. I think that you can even meet up with friends better when you're boondocking. Now, there are tons of rallies at RV parks. In fact, the big grand design, we have a grand design, the big grand design rally is at a fairground. So we said in the beginning, we can call that an RV park. But I think it's easier to meet up with friends when you're boondocking. If you're not staying in the LTVA, I'm sure they wouldn't mind just take a quick drive through there you don't have to go very far and you'll see people circling the wagons. You can get your community literally like a community. You've got people facing each other, your patios are there, you've got a nice fire pit in the, in the middle of it, you've got your bikes out, kids are playing, dogs are happy. It's just a really home type situation for as long as you're there. Let's see. You'll, another benefit of boondocking over RV parks is going to be you can go places where there are no RV parks. As I already mentioned, you're not going to find an RV park anywhere on that road. <laughs> all right, let's go to the realities because it's not all sunshine and unicorns. All right, RV park realities is, now this is a picture that we actually took. It's an old defunct RV park, so I'm not going to mislead you. It's not an active place to stay. However, RV parks do often have different prices online than you do when you actually pay for it. And it's not that they're being deceptive, not at all. It's just that in the times we live in, you know what's happening with inflation. Everything goes more up, more expensive. And unfortunately, a lot of these RV parks are run by people who are really strung thin. And they're working a lot of jobs in that park, so they don't have time to update the website, and the website might be 10 years old. So that's an extreme example, but you need to always verify the price because the prices in the pictures might not be accurate. They might just be out of date. That does happen, it's happened to us. Another reality is we talked about the pictures. RV parks are notorious for bad Wi-Fi. If you work like we do and you need Wi-Fi, you need internet of some kind, there are RV parks that have good Wi-Fi. Sometimes it's free, sometimes the free stuff is useless, and you have a paid tier of Wi-Fi. 
But you should always, always, always at least have a backup, whether it's a hotspot, whether it's your mobile phone to be used as a hotspot. You should always plan on having your own internet solution if that's your thing. If you need the internet, please always have it. Provide it yourself. And that way, if you have park Wi-Fi, hey, that's a benefit. That's gravy on top. I say gravy because I don't eat sugar. Uh, let's see. Internet connection. Provide your own internet. Noisy. Not all RV parks are noisy. But you do have, just think about it, you got all those people and all those rigs and all those trucks and cars and tow vehicles and everything in one small space. You're more likely, when you have 200 people surrounding you, to be a little bit more noisy than when you're on the top of a mountain. If you're in Grouse Mountain, Wyoming, you're not going to have that much noise. All right, let's go to boondocking realities. And I know it's not a pretty picture. I did not actually take this picture. I like to use extremes to prove my point because it's just easier. So this is a picture of trash. And the reason I bring it up is because it's one of the things that really gets to me is when boondocking, we see a lot of instances like this. Now, not this extreme, but we've seen furniture. We've seen small engines, diapers. We've seen trash that looks just like this in boondocking spots. And there are several reasons why boondocking spots get closed down. Try to go to Sedona and find you all boondocking spots of the old glory days. A lot of them are shut down now. you got to be in a group spot somewhere and be real creative if you want to find them. That's because there are several reasons. The only reason I'm going to cover is this. So if we can pack it in, pack it out, I'm sure everybody here is uh, going to do that. But if you can remind your friends to do the same thing, and you don't have to clean up everything there. You know, we're not a Boy Scout troop, but if you want to take a bag, a Walmart bag, and clean up a few little pieces of junk around the campsite, that really is going to help it out because the rangers or the government who runs these things, they don't have that much of a budget, and they don't have that many people. And whether we agree with that or not, they can't go and be our nannies. So we have to do our best to try to keep it open because I love them dying. I don't want to see this. That's not appealing. All right, one of the other <laughs> realities that doesn't have to stop you or slow you down, but it might, is the roads. If you're looking at the National Forest Service, God bless them, they have a lot of forest roads, don't they? But a lot of them are in horrible conditions, so just know that ahead of time. It doesn't mean it'll stop you, it just means you might have to have a high clearance vehicle, or you might want to scout it out ahead of time. We're also looking at, for the roads, we're talking about mainly potholes, ruts, because when it gets muddy and it solidifies, you know, it's going to be kind of hard for Prius, for example, to go over. But I have seen just yesterday a Prius up boondocking, so it does happen. Permanent people. Again, we're not passing judgment, it's just a harsh reality, is when you're boondocking, I'm not talking about staying a few days extra because the ranger said, yeah, whatever, we're not busy. I'm talking about permanent people, people who go and drop their trailer for good, and they leave it there all year, and they call that their summer camp or whatever. It happens a lot, especially in Wyoming. They're having a heck of a time with that in Wyoming. So my only m message to you on that is if you find the perfect place, don't be surprised if you scout it out ahead of time, and by the time you leave, people are still there, and their rig is packed up, their slides are in, their doors are closed, and you haven't seen movement at all, it happens. Not much we can do about it. All right. Next picture, please. And this is not feedback on me. This is feedback. This is RV park tips. The biggest tip I can tell you for RV parks is read reviews and leave reviews. Now, RV parks you're going to find on Google. You're also going to find them on all the major campsites, uh, websites like Campinium, RV Life, All Stays, all that kind of stuff. And the reason is because we mentioned the RV park owners before. Giving them the benefit of the doubt, their website might not be updated. There are, might be some who, maybe something more nefarious goes on. You don't know exactly how up-to-date that is. Read the reviews. You don't have to believe all the reviews, but if 10 people in a row talk about this problem or that problem or this wonderful thing or that wonderful thing, you know, maybe think about it. And if that fits your schedule, then fine. If that fits your needs, then that's great. If it doesn't, then count yourself blessed because now you figured out ahead of time what some people might not because they don't do the research. Another tip for RV parks, verify your reservation. Again, if you make your reservation online especially or if you use some of these third-party apps to make reservations, please, a lot of these RV parks are not run by major corporations and even the ones that are our franchise. So call, 
two days ahead of time, maybe a week ahead of time, email them if you can't get a hold of them, verify your reservation because it's not always going to go through. Verify your hookups too. Y'all, I can't tell you how many RV parks we've been to where they offer full hookups over here and partial hookups over there or no hookups in this spot over here. And just because you made a reservation doesn't mean you know what kind of hookups you're getting. Please, it only takes a minute if you can get a hold of them. Hey, do I have a reservation? What kind of hookups am I looking at on that spot? Oh, yeah, you got water and electric. What about sewer? Okay, deal with that before you get there. It's always easier to do it in advance. At least I think so. And another thing is, and this is, we're going to cover this in boondocking too, a big tip is plan your route. Now you're going to go through the tents today and you're probably, I don't know who's there, maybe Garmin's there, maybe some of the other apps are here. I think RV Life is a sponsor of here and they probably do uh, destination planning, trip planning. So that being what it is, they're not 100% perfect. Some are better than others. We have a Garmin 890 and it is not absolutely perfect. And I'm talking about things like bridge heights because what do they do over time? They repave the roads or they might have an old bridge. Um, turns you might have a grade if you have an older vehicle you don't want to go up a six percent grade you might find out that you need to know that ahead of time you can do all that quick research sean does all of our navigating and she does all our route playing and she's got it down to a disgruntled art we'll call it it's not always fun but she's gotten pretty good at it and i know how hairy it's going to be based on how loud she gets when she's doing the planning um, another thing you can do planning, and by planning I don't mean sit in front of your computer for an hour. This doesn't have to take long, but Google. I'm not putting Google versus Apple, but if you know Google Maps, they have a thing called a measuring tool. For me, I just right click and click measuring tool. And you can measure the site. You know if you've been in any RV parks before, they're not always accurate on their measurements. I don't know what they used to measure these spots with, but they're not always 60 feet if you pay for 60 feet. If you have a big boy rig, and you need 70 feet or more, you've got to measure that ahead of time just to be sure because they, their marketing department might not talk to the people on the ground if they even have a marketing department. And that's free, and it usually only takes a few minutes. All right, moving on to boondocking tips, it's going to be the same picture because it's my same first piece of advice. Leave reviews and read reviews. Now, you're not going to find too many boondocking spots on Google. It does exist, but you're going to look at Compendium, RV Life, All Stays, all the big apps. So, some of the other boondocking tips, and we do a lot of boondocking, is scout ahead. Now, that can mean one of two things. There might be other ways of doing it, but the two biggest ways I know to do it are number one, you can do what we do. We try to find an RV park in the area if we've never been there before. And then we detach for maybe one night, two if you want to do a bunch of laundry. And then we'll drive around and scout it out. What are you looking for? Well, you're not necessarily going to find all the spots open that you find when you're scouting, but you're looking, can I turn around? If this goes completely sideways and there's no spots available, can I get out of there? Do I have a 45-foot motorhome and I can't turn around? Can you back up? You need to know these things. Is it accessible to you? Are the websites up to date? The last 10 reviewers, did nobody take a picture of that big rut in the middle of the road that's impassable for you? Know before you get there. You can even take an e-bike or a regular bicycle or even walk. The other way to scout it out is to not pay for an RV park. You can do what some YouTubers have I have seen done, which is park in the easiest spot you can find. The easiest boondocking spot you can find and do the same thing I just mentioned from there. Scout it out. It's always a good idea. If you've been there before and you know what it looks like year after year, then fine. But if you've never been there and you have a rig that is susceptible to maybe not fitting everywhere it's not a jeep with a teardrop then you might want to do that more tips plan your groceries ahead where are we we're in quartzsite arizona it's a great little town and this is a great get together but the grocery stores are not built for these many people and the prices aren't always what you might be looking for now i found in the stores around here they have great meat prices but maybe the stuff on the shelves isn't quite so cheap if you're on a budget like we are plan ahead if you know you're going somewhere like that go to walmart target wherever you like shopping albertson's um, plan the groceries ahead of time that you know are going to be more expensive and then get locally what you feel is good to get locally another tip for boondocking if you have a fifth wheel like we do you know that the fifth wheel trailer hangs over the bed of the truck when you're driving right so what if the truck goes this way and the trailer goes that way ouch we've seen that happen we've seen people rip through a drainage ditch it didn't it happened in um 
by the salt flats in Utah. It's crazy. Watch your angles. Just because people have been there doesn't mean you should go there. Or maybe you need to go slower. Get out your shovel and maybe create the road down if you need to. I'm sure people have done that. Another tip. If you have a travel trailer, you can't necessarily turn 90 degrees if you want to back into a spot. These kinds of things you need to watch out for when boondocking because nature is a lot less precise than an RV park, usually. All right, we covered the reviews. Okay, if you're boondocking, like we know we can last for two weeks. What does that mean? We know with our fresh water, we can last for two weeks. Now, we have to bring water in, and we have a blue can we got from Walmart. It says it's seven gallons. Here's a hint. It's really six and a half. It's like a two by four ain't two by four. But we do bring water in, and we know about how much water we need to bring. So we make sure there's fresh water nearby somewhere. What are you going to do? Do you want to get a big bladder? It looks like a pillow. You can do that, and you can just get it once, and you're done for the whole trip. Or maybe you have a super-sized tank. What are you going to do with your gray water and black water? You should know these things ahead of time. Or if you don't, then I guess that's part of your discovery process. You'll learn. What are you going to do? Do you want to get a hard blue boy where you tow it behind? You'll see that all over the place in the LTVA. They do have some pillow bladders for gray water, believe it or not. And I think they have a few for black water, but they're not cheap. Do you need a macerator? What are you going to do? Our friends Nomadic Ramblers are huge proponents of composting toilets. I'm not going to go into the specifics of that, but it is much easier if emptying the black tank when you're boondocking is not your thing. <coughs> they love it. I would highly recommend checking them out. They don't even know I'm saying that, by the way, but highly recommend checking them out if that's your thing. They've been through some. They built one themselves, and now they use a professional one that they love. Other tips for boondocking. What are you going to do about power? Um, we use solar, and or are you going to use a generator? Well, we have a generator, too. We use both. In the summertime and the spring, I've only had to pull out the old generator once because the sun was that good to us. But in the wintertime, if winter camping is your thing, the sun's not up for very long, and we've had an unusual amount of clouds before this week that we're in now. Really cloudy, really foggy, kind of rainy, so the generator comes back out to play. What are you going to do? What's your solution? You should know that ahead of time. If you don't know it ahead of time, that's fine. You can learn as you go, but make sure you're learning as you go and then prepare better for your next outing. Wrapping this up, we've got a few more tips. And I talked about the composting toilet. Oh yeah, internet. Now hopefully you don't need the internet when you're boondocking. We do. So Starlink is a great newfangled thing. It's not quite in our budget yet, but everybody we talked to said, you've got to get it, you've got to get it, you've got to get it. So I guess we have to get it. Um, being around here, I think they have a temporary cell tower, but normally the internet's not going to be great during the courtside show, but it's screaming fast right now. Thank God for that. But you might go places where the internet's not going to be that good. That's another thing that the reviews are going to tell you. They're not going to be 100% precise because your device might get better reception than the people leaving the review, but you should know that ahead of time or just plan not to communicate with anybody if that doesn't bother you. I wish we could do that. All right. Um... Oh yeah, the last tip is going to be the same as with the RV parks, y'all. It's going to be check out your satellite. You can still measure things. Now, you don't have to be so picky that you're measuring every inch along the way. Don't be scared of boondocking. Sometimes you just have to head out there. But it doesn't hurt to use the measurement tool because a road might not be long enough for you. Uh, a spot between two trees that your neighbor used to go to who has the same size rig might not be comfortable for you. You know your abilities. You know what you can do. You know where you want to take your rig. You should at least. And if you don't, then you'll get comfortable with that. Use a measurement tool. It's very simple, very painless. And again, it's not going to be 100% precise because you're taking a, you're using a satellite picture taken from space, but it's a pretty good indicator about how comfortable you should be in an area. And sometimes, I think we've done this before, if it's kind of on the edge, you just go anyways, and the, what's the worst that can happen? You have to back up or turn around. But just knowing ahead of time is always better than not knowing. It doesn't take the mystery out of it. It just helps you have a better time if you have less if the crisis ferry doesn't come to visit you while you're camping. 